Christian soldiers. He who gave his life for you now demands yours in return. These battles are worthy of you. They are fights in which it is glorious to conquer and beneficial to die. Thus, with death, achieve immortal praise and conquer an eternal kingdom. The 13th century is considered the golden age of Christianity. It features great figures such as Saint Albertus Magnus, Saint Thomas Aquinas, and Saint Bonaventure. So many saints, theologians and philosophers. And among them, there was a nobleman, the real and holy Saint Ferdinand III. Fernando III el Santo. What motivated his government, his conquests, and his reign? How is it possible that he could be a king and a saint? Let's find out. To begin to understand the situation in Spain, we have to go back to the beginning of the 13th century, when the kingdoms of Castile, León, Navarre, and Aragon are eager to reconquer lands that have been snatched away. In a place between Zamora and Salamanca, a child is about to be born who is destined to play a prominent role in political, economic, social, and above all, religious restoration in Spain. The life of Saint Ferdinand is interesting from the very moment of his birth because he was already on his path. He was a man who built his life little by little. It was a complicated life from the moment he was born in Villa de la Plata, which is known today as Peleas de Arriba, a very small village in the Zamora province. Ferdinand was born on what we think was probably Saint John the Baptist Day. There's no exact data, which would have been on the 20th 24th of June, 1201. Years later, he commemorated this fact by founding the Valparaiso Monastery, very close to his birthplace. At the time of Ferdinand III's birth, the Kingdom of Castile was ruled by Alfonso VIII, an exceptional person in every way. Ferdinand's mother, Berengaria, was the king's firstborn daughter from his marriage to Eleanor Plantagenet of England. Nacida del matrimonio del rey Alfonso VIII con Leonor de Inglaterra, Leonor Plantagenet. Una 
He had a very quiet childhood in this very place, the Basilica of San Isidoro. His father, Alfonso IX, was a great warrior. He was a man who promoted culture. Along with Master Matteo and others, he gave the final push to complete the Romanesque cathedral in Santiago de Compostela, which can still be admired today. His father also endorsed the University of Salamanca. In other words, he was an educated and learned man. He was the first monarch to convoke parliament in the history of Europe in 1188. So Ferdinand was brought up by a great man, but also also by a great woman, which must be said of Berengaria. She was a wise and discreet woman. She was also powerful in the sense that she was actively involved in major events in Castile and later in Lyon. On the other hand, it was a quiet childhood, since being second in line to the throne of Leon, people only thought of him as the second prince, born of a strategic marriage between Castile and Leon. The circumstances of his birth and his early years meant that nobody predicted the great king he would later become. It was due to providence that he became the king of Castile and Leon. Because of the circumstances of his parents' marriage, which was annulled by the Pope on the grounds of consanguinity issues, his early years were not those of someone who was destined to reign, and therefore there wasn't a great deal of attention paid to him. The truth is that we have very little information about those early years, except that he was with his parents at court or moving from one place to another. As with all children in the Middle Ages, we know little, but we are certain that the Leonese monarch's upbringing was strongly influenced by San Isidoro, this place, and by some of the great abbots who walked these halls. Above of all, it's an environment which invokes something important, the legacy of centuries spent defending the idea of a united Christian Spain. The peninsula is fragmented into different kingdoms, but the monarchs of Leon hold a title meaning Emperor of all Spain, passed down by their ancestors. Indeed, his childhood here was an incredible history lesson. If he stood at Alfonso V's tomb, someone might tell him about the cities he conquered in Portugal, and that in the year 1017 he granted jurisdiction to the kingdom, the first territorial laws in the history of Europe. At the same time, he would learn about Doña Uraca, the Queen of Zamora, or hear the story of Bermu. In other words, it was a wonderful lesson. We could say the same about almost every inch of this very place. On the other hand, thanks to his parents, there was a more human side. From his mother, he learned to understand politics in a more relaxed and patient way, without taking the initiative as much as his father did. His father was, to use a colloquial term, very gutsy, whereas his mother was much more reflective. So Ferdinand learned that sometimes war is necessary, but there are times when it's better to sit down and negotiate peace. And I think he learned that precisely because no one considered him the future heir. Had he been the future heir, without a doubt, his education would have been radically different. Certainly, faith in God is present from the start, from square one. Why? Because he's at the center of a very special place that's closely linked to the spiritual world. When the sensitivity of a child develops in the right way, they observe absorb everything like a sponge. Ferdinand III was that sponge, and this was fundamental. What we do know is something that I always emphasize about St. Ferdinand's life, which was the constant presence of his mother, Queen Berengaria. It's a critical aspect of the prince's upbringing. It was the preparation that she gave him which shaped the truly exemplary king that we all know Ferdinand III became. There's a relevant anecdote which shows Queen Berengaria's intense religious faith. It's a famous story. A child falls gravely ill, and there are fears for his life, since his disease has no cure. The mother decides to take him to a sanctuary in Castile, 
the monastery of Onya. Before the image of the Virgin, the child heals. The chronicle records that this is a source of immense joy for the mother and for the court. Well, this mother, who's worried about her son, is Queen Berengaria. She has immense faith and doesn't hesitate in a moment of adversity to kneel. It is said that she spent a whole night in prayer, kneeling before the Virgin, praying for the health of the son in whom she had all her hopes, not only her personal hopes, but also the hopes of Castile at a very difficult time for the crown. heaven, remember that you are the mother of mercy. Look upon him, my son who is your son. It is unheard of that whoever belongs to you and trusts you returns disheartened. Look upon him. He is your servant, and you must heal him if you want him to serve you. It didn't seem that this child would succeed to the throne, which was held by his grandfather, Alfonso VIII, and his mother, Berengaria. But the unexpected happened. The Hispanic kingdoms at this time are closely related, even coming from the same family lineage, and those family ties are renewed through marriages. Some of them had to be annulled because the couple was too closely related. The kingdoms are also characterized, perhaps more importantly, by their aspirations to reunite and restore the Visigothic kingdom. Ferdinand III ascended the throne of Castile in 1217 and the throne of Leon in 1230. In principle, he wasn't a candidate for either throne. In Leon, there was a half-brother, son from Alfonso. 
Alphonse IX's first marriage, also called Ferdinand. And in Castile, he had two uncles, one of them also called Ferdinand, who came before him in line to the throne. A whole series of circumstances converged. He was born the son of a princess, but there were two uncles who came before him. One of them was even younger than him, the Prince Ferdinand, who was born in 1189 and died in 1211 in a campaign in the Sierra de San Vicente against the Muslims. In the year 1204, three years after our King Ferdinand was born, another uncle of his was born, Henry I. Henry I succeeded his father Alfonso VIII, who died in 1214. He was his only surviving son, and Berengaria, St. Ferdinand III's mother, took charge of the regency as she was Henry's elder sister by almost 20 years. Berengaria was in Castile with her children when her marriage to Alphonse IX of Leon was declared invalid. As Queen of Leon and Castile, she had always shown good judgment, great diplomatic ability, the wisdom of a queen who had gone through immense personal trauma, and deep religious faith that also greatly influenced her son, Saint Ferdinand. When Henry I dies, aged 14, in an accident, the kingdom decides that Berengaria is next in line to the throne. However, possibly in accordance with the kingdom's customs, some nobles decide to give the throne of Castile to her son, Ferdinand III. He was already 16 years old, he was of age, and he was immediately able to lead the military campaigns that were crucial at that moment. There are different opinions about where he was proclaimed king. Undeniably, the temporary proclamation was in Autillo de Campos. It was still subject to the kingdom's confirmation in a general assembly, or an extraordinary curia. But from that moment, some documents began to describe him as king of Castile. However, the actual crowning of Ferdinand as King of Castile didn't take place until a general assembly in the town of Valladolid at the beginning of July 1217. Certainly, when Alfonso IX learns about this maneuver by his ex-wife, Berengaria, he immediately orders an expedition to Castile. He focuses his attention on Burgos, He's counting on the support that Álvaro Núñez de Lara is said to have for him. Alfonso IX, Ferdinand's father, was angry, and he gathered an army and marched directly to Burgos to engage his son in combat. However, a letter that he received from his son changed everything. Father, why are you so aggrieved? Why do you wage war on me? My well-being seems to weigh on your mind when you should be proud to have a king of Castile for a son. Know that in my lifetime, there will be no harm or war from this kingdom. I don't want to march against you, my father, but keep silent and suffer until you understand what you do. How did he succeed to the throne of his father, the King of Leon? How were the two crowns of Castile and Leon united? We will see. In 1230, Alfonso IX of Leon dies and Ferdinand III claims his right to the throne of Leon. He arrives in Leon and some subjects are loyal to him, while others favor the princesses, Sancha and Dulce. The solution comes through a meeting of the two widow queens, Teresa and Berengaria. 
Berenguela. Las dos reinas viudas, podríamos decirlo así. The widow queens, Teresa and Berengaria, met in the town of Valencia de Don Juan with the two princesses, who at the time were 38 and 36 years old, and they came to an agreement together. An agreement that shows Berengaria's skill and know-how, as well as the generosity of Teresa and her daughters. From this day forward, Ferdinand III is proclaimed the rightful king across the kingdom. Above all, his ascension to the throne of Leon is thanks to the affection of his mother, who, together with Teresa, later beatified Saint Teresa in 1705, reached an extremely important agreement for the kingdom's peace and prosperity. In 1230, those two powerful kingdoms reunited. Although they always marched together under Leon's command, now it's Castile, the son who is stronger. From this moment on, the crown of Castile and Leon is the great driving force of the dynamics of Spanish Christianity. So, in 1230, Leon and Castile unite permanently. The crown is born and never separates again. With her son's consent, Berengaria sent an entourage from Castile to Germany to ask the emperor's daughter, Beatrice of Swabia, for her hand in marriage. The Archbishop of Toledo described her as a judicious, beautiful and modest woman with all the virtues required to be a king's wife. We know that Beatrice was a maiden raised in the court of Frederick II of Hohenstaufen. He was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, the most powerful man in Europe at the time. She was the daughter of Emperor Philip and her mother was descended from Byzantine emperors and the kings of Armenia, which was one of the oldest Christian kingdoms in the world. We're therefore talking about a lady whose lineage far exceeded that of her prospective husband, Saint Ferdinand. She was a highly sought-after maiden in the European courts. Besides that, we know from Rodrigo Jimenez Dorada's description and from the sculpture of the Queen in Burgos Cathedral, which is quite realistic, that she was a beautiful and intelligent woman. Beatrice and the King will go on to have many children, ten in fact, and she will die very young in the year 1235. Each one of their children was knighted and each of their swords was designed by Beatrice. According to Alfonso X, the Virgin performed a couple of miracles on Beatrice, which appear in Troubadour's songs, and she was an extraordinarily devout woman. We know that she was cultured, she knew about history, and she understood many disciplines that meant she was extremely knowledgeable for her time. If we add talent, physical beauty, and above all her social skills that made her extraordinarily loved in the Hispanic kingdoms, she was the perfect wife for the perfect king. It was customary for the nobles of the time to be knighted. Saint Ferdinand wanted to be knighted before getting married, so he did the prayer vigil and watched over the swords, and three days after being knighted, married Beatrice of Swabia. From that moment on, everything was for the glory and service of God and his country. I want to make your whole life a wonderful representation and parable, so that the coming centuries contemplate the war that I, the Eternal King and the Universal Lord, wage against the power of darkness. Ferdinand, you shall be the noblest and kindest king who leads his vassals in this great enterprise. You, the brave and suffering king 
who faces danger and above all others bears the fatigue of conflict. He wanted the royal wedding with Beatrice of Swabia to coincide with his investiture as a knight. He was preparing to take on the many roles, in terms of family and lineage, that the royal wedding represented, at the same time as preparing spiritually for his knighthood. This era is deep in the Crusades. Saint Ferdinand is first and foremost a crusader king, so the knighthood is a way for him to demonstrate how he personally embodies all those ideals. Christ, my Lord, I am in your hands, as this sword is in mine. Show me, my king, what you want from your knight. A ritual followed that varied according to the region, area and time. Basically, it involved a prayer vigil in which the future knight stayed up watching over swords that had been blessed by the church and by a bishop, if possible. Afterwards, an extraordinarily simple ritual followed. Everything in the Middle Ages was full of substance, unlike other eras, including today, where a formal simplicity reigns. Generally, this ritual involved receiving taps with the sword on the shoulder or on the neck. Well, the king couldn't do it for a very simple reason. The king had to invest himself as a knight. A king could not receive the investiture from anybody else because he was the highest authority within the kingdom, so no one else could knight him. I, Ferdinand, King of Castile, swear to God all-powerful that I will risk death to defend your holy law and my land. In 1235, Queen Beatrice died, leaving a hole not only in the kingdom, but also in the king's own heart. He lost his perfect companion. Berengaria, who was always willing to protect and love her precious son, Saint Ferdinand, decided to look for a second wife for him. However, he didn't want a second wife. Saint Ferdinand argued, I was happy with this woman. I have enough heirs to guarantee the kingdoms. I don't need to remarry. But Doña Berengaria insisted that the king could not walk alone and needed a companion. It was the French court that found him a perfect second wife, Joan of Damartin, also called Joan of Ponthieu. She was a noblewoman, countess of some territories in the north of France, very powerful, economically speaking, descended from the French royal house and very beautiful. She had already been married, which meant that she was a fitting companion for a widower. From this second marriage, he had five children, three of whom reached adulthood. So Saint Ferdinand had 13 surviving children. It's possible that two, three or maybe four others died during childhood. I 
I know that Jesus Christ is within me. To speak to him, I close my eyes and tell him that he is my King and Lord, and I am his knight, and that I want to do great deeds for him in the crusade against the Moors, and I want to give him my blood, and his glorious mother is my lady. The Crusades of the 13th century were not limited only to conquests of the Holy Land. Here in Spain, Muslims had seized lands from the Christians, who now became strong in the northern part of Spain. From that point on, every Christian king wanted to reconquer the lands that had been taken and restore them to the Visigothic kingdom. In 711, the Muslims invaded Spain, bringing the Visigothic kingdom to an end. The main consequence of the Muslim conquest was that Spain was pulled apart. This meant going from a Christian society with a Western Latin culture to an Arab society with an Islamic culture, with everything this entailed, like political theocracy and views about power, society, women, everything. Following the Muslim conquest of Spain, certain pockets of resistance slowly emerged in the north of the peninsula. These pockets tried at first to survive or even coexist with the Islamic rule in Al-Andalus. However, from the 9th century onwards, there's a clear concern for recovering and politically restoring the Visigothic kingdom, but also, crucially, with a religious undercurrent. They want to recover the church that has been suppressed, the Christian unity that has been broken, and those dioceses that existed and prospered in Visigothic Spain and have disappeared under Muslim rule. Therefore, a concept arises of political and religious war in defense of faith and against Islam. From the 11th century, we see that this idea of a true holy war rises to the concept of crusade, which is springing up throughout all Western Europe. There is a real militarization of society with this idea of restoring Visigothic Spain and the Church and defending the faith. Perhaps the most recent milestone of St. Ferdinand's era is the year 1212, when the Spanish Christian kingdoms achieved a critical victory against the Muslims. Las Navas de Tolosa was an especially important Christian battle. It was of extreme significance. The kings of Castile, Navarre and Aragon joined together. At a crucial moment, the Archbishop of Toledo, Rodrigo Jiménez de Rada, rallied all those who were in the rear. They united and attacked head-on. It seemed impossible to break the Miramamolin defences, but they broke, defeated and overcame them. And thanks to this, Spain was saved. Your Grace, we're all going to die here. God forbid that we die here. We must triumph over our enemies. Then let's go help those at the front who are in great trouble. When Ferdinand ascends to the throne, he finds that, in Castilian society, enthusiasm for war has declined. 
What he does is unite the entire population to fight again against the Muslim world. It's a terrible fight. He manages to gather all his forces to go forward. Rather than political, his strategy is spiritual. It's for the glory of God and the restoration of Christianity. Dear mother and gentle lady, what good is the kingdom of Castile that you gave me with your abdication? And a wife so noble who you brought me from distant lands and who is united with me in untold love? What good is the zeal with which you anticipate all my desires, fulfilling them with motherly love before I have conceived them? If I am trapped in laziness, if the flower of my youth fruitlessly vanishes, and if the radiance of the beginning of my reign is extinguished, the time has come, appointed by Almighty God, when I can serve Jesus Christ, for whom kings reign in the war against the enemies of the Christian faith, for the honor and glory of his name. The door is open and the way is clear. We have peace in the kingdom and the moors burn in discord. Christ, God and man are on our side. What are we waiting for? I beg of you, mother of mine, to whom after God I owe all that I have, Give me license to declare war on the Moors. The life of St. Ferdinand during his first years as King of Castile is extraordinarily fascinating because he recreates the momentum that his grandfather Alfonso VIII had begun with successes like Las Navas and failures like Alacos. He knows what he must do to pave the way to the Guadalquivir Valley. His idea was to end the reconquest in the blink of an eye, that is, in his own reign, and we can say that he almost achieved this. When in his initial years as King of Castile, the search for new territories in Andalusia begins Jaén is set as the clear objective. Why? Because it was the way that Alfonso VIII had paved. It's therefore logical to attack the kingdom of Jaén and from there to extend across the Guadalquivir. When Saint Ferdinand ascends to the thrones of Castile in 1217 and Leon in 1230, he finds the Almohad Empire fragmented into Taifa kingdoms. This fragmentation weakens the unity of Islam and sets the stage for Christian invasion. Two things are surprising when you analyze those years of Ferdinand's reign. First of all, his excellent stature as a strategist, general and man of arms. He's a perfect gentleman, yes, but he's also a great general who knows how to take advice and who listens. It's fundamental for a king to know how to take advice and listen. What's more, he makes the right decisions. Another interesting fact is that in 1225, before he becomes King of Leon, the Pope gives him a Bull of the Crusade. What does this mean? It means when a European knight wants to fight against the infidels, that is to say against the Muslims, he can do it in the Holy Land, as we imagine when we think about Crusades, or he can do it on the Iberian Peninsula, under the flags of St. Ferdinand. From 1225, whoever fights under the flags of Ferdinand III fights as a crusader in defense of Christianity. It's often said that he was the last of the medieval kings. He probably was, if you consider the military campaigns he personally led with a firm hand. But also because, as a man of great faith and a soldier of Christ, he always attributed his successes to God. Above all else is the idea of reconquering a lost kingdom, 
the kingdom of the Goths, a Christian and Catholic kingdom, which a foreign force had occupied and which the Mozarabic Chronicle of 754 sees as the loss of Spain. The religious component of the reconquest is there from the start. But sometime later, this idea of the crusade from the Western Latin Church will be introduced. The crusade is a war that tries to restore the Christian faith in lands that were once Christian. It reflects the desire of the men who live in these lands to be part of Western Christianity and the Western Christian world. Foxes have burrows, and the birds of heaven have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Follow me. I have put my hand on the plow, Lord, and I will not look back. The reconquest of the Guadalquivir Valley takes between 25 and 30 years. We must divide the campaigns into three major stages. The first stage, which goes from 1224 to 1230, involves scouting campaigns. These are expeditions to Jaén and Martos, which lead to the final conquest of Baza in 1226. At the second stage, which is much more intense, more strongholds are reconquered. In this second stage, from 1230 to 1235, Ferdinand reconquers the strongholds of Quesada in 1231, Trujillo and Obeda in 1233, followed by Isnatorov and San Sisteban. And the last stage, from 1236 to 1248, is when the great Andalusian cities are reconquered. Cordova in 1236, Jaén in 1246, and finally Seville in 1248. While the king was in Benevente, settling matters of the Leon crown, which was already happily united to the crown of Castile, he received the news that Cordoba had fallen in a completely unthinkable way. What happened was that some Moors in Cordoba encountered some border guards from Andujar and made a pact with them to surrender Cordoba. The surrounding region of Azaquia was dangerously undermanned. Obviously, Ferdinand III was completely unaware of the situation, but as soon as he heard about the occupation, Ferdinand III uttered a sentence which has become famous. If anyone wants to be my friend and my vassal, follow me. Immediately, with very few knights around him, in the middle of winter, he rode to Cordova. According to the Chronicle, he rode day and night, picking up people who joined him along the way. Throughout the journey, he sent word to others who were also on their way to Cordova. He arrived in Cordova in record time, with very few soldiers, to support his men. They had taken over a small part of the city, but the rest of the city was occupied by the enemy, and they were completely surrounded. St. Ferdinand's actions meant that his men could trust him. It's this simple. You know that a king who acts like that will never abandon you. Sometime after conquering the city, he declares that it was thanks to divine providence. So, rather recklessly, he crosses from Benevente to Cordova. That is to say, he crosses half of the kingdom in the middle of winter in terrible conditions because the roads are impassable. He arrives roughly in the month of February near Cordova in Alcolea. He organizes what is known as the siege. A few months later, on the 29th of June of that year, 1236, on the day of the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, Cordova was finally a Christian city. 
Fernando III, pues, Ferdinand III declared that the cross had to enter Cordoba first. San Lope de Fetero, who later became the first bishop of Cordoba, entered the city carrying the first cross, followed by the Castile banner. This procession crossed the Roman bridge, then the gate of the bridge. They traveled all along the western side and the outside area of the mosque, entered the orange tree courtyard, and then proceeded to restore the places of worship. First, the exterior is purified by throwing holy water and salt on the facades. Then, inside, to reclaim possession, a layer of ash is placed on the pavement. A few letters are drawn, and the altar is consecrated. In this case, they consecrated Santa Maria. This church, since Ferdinand III, was devoted to the Mother of God, St. Mary. All the mosques, which he transformed into cathedrals, were dedicated to St. Mary. The siege of Seville was carried out between August 1247 and November 1248. Seville was ruled by the Muslims under Ashataf. He had made a pontoon bridge on the Guadalquivir River. Before entering the city of Seville, the Christians had to break that pontoon bridge, and they broke it. With the Guadalquivir at his feet and the sounds of troops in the distance, a starry night shining on his spurs. Ferdinand is the groom, and Seville the bride. If we want to take the city, we must break the Triana Bridge, and to do that, we must go up the river. The city of Seville, occupied after many months of siege, almost a year and a half, was the capital of the Almohad Empire on the Iberian Peninsula. In the words of Alfonso X the Wise, a few years after the king's death, Seville was the capital of the entire Andalusian territory. It was by far Castile's biggest conquest, not only in area, but in terms of population. Never had Castile conquered such an important city, with a port and an exit to the sea nearby. The Guadalquivir was much wider and deeper than we know it today. The chronicles say that when he enters Seville, he leaves his sword outside. What does this mean? It means that his entry to Seville will not only be by a man's will, but God's will. He enters by divine will, not by iron will. That's important. It is true that, as he enters Seville, a vision appears to him of the Virgin of the Antigua. The Virgin of the Antigua was an icon of the Virgin Mary that was inside or near the Mudejar Cathedral. We don't know exactly where. She was walled up because every Arab who tried to destroy her fell ill and died. It is said that San Ferdinand has this vision and that when he enters, he discovers this image of the Virgin from the 8th century. There are many miracles involved, for which he always credits Saint Mary. A vision of the Virgin of the Kings appears to him during a difficult moment of the siege, and he asks for Saint Mary's intervention to ease the fatigue of his troops who are besieging the city. He can't discern her size until, miraculously, some Flemish or German sculptors carve her 
And he says that it is indeed her. She's a Gothic virgin, seated triumphantly with her child. She is a Theotokos, mother of God. My lady, St. Mary, you who protect my cause will be my help and my defense. The Virgin of the Kings is an icon that was in the royal chapel of Ferdinand III's encampment. She's Seville's patron saint and archdiocese. She's very, very venerated there. In 1248, when St. Ferdinand conquers Seville, he lets the Virgin of the Kings enter before he does. St. Ferdinand III consecrated the city of Seville to the Virgin, something which has been maintained until today. When we speak about Seville, we have to mention devotion to the Virgin, especially the three virgins who were in St. Ferdinand III's heart. The Virgin of the Battles, the Virgin of Valme, and the Virgin of the Eagle. The Virgin of the Battles was carried by St. Ferdinand to protect him from war. I've also heard that St. Ferdinand carried her, not only for protection, but also so that if any enemy who lay dying on the battlefield looked at the Virgin, she would convert him. The history of devotion of the Virgin of Valme dates to the siege of Seville by King St. Ferdinand in 1248. According to our tradition, which we know from our elders, the troops of St. Ferdinand were encamped on the hill, today called Cortijo de Cuarto, during a difficult campaign. King St. Ferdinand invoked the protection and courage of the Virgin, to whom he was very devoted, with a prayer which we know and love. Valme, meaning help me, to conquer Seville, to restore it to the Christian faith. And the Holy King promises the Virgin that he'll build for her in that same place on the hill of Cuarto a chapel, a hermitage in which he would place an image that he carried in his military campaigns. He also offers her the first banner under which he defeated the Muslims of Seville. Once the city is conquered, on the 23rd of November, 1248, St. Ferdinand fulfills his promise, builds the chapel, and leaves the image that we continue to venerate today, in the St. Mary Magdalene Parish, in the city of Dos Hermanas, and that because of St. Ferdinand's prayer is known as Our Lady of Valme. My Lady, St. Mary, today we have suffered from fatigue, thirst, and the sun, but I would willingly suffer much more if I could see you Queen of Andalusia. The history of this holy place dates to the year 1246, when King Ferdinand III of Castile took control of the town on the 21st of September, feast day of St. Matthew.
Alcalá de Guadaira has preserved the ruins of the castle where St. Ferdinand III anxiously spent two years planning the attack on Seville. Two years of anxious planning for the reconquering of Seville. Alcalá de Guadaira was a small town, but it was important because it supplied flour and water to Seville. Flour and water meaning bread, an essential food supply which still happens today. The first thing the Christians did was to cut off the supplies of both flour and water to create the right conditions for the attack. Suficiente para el ataque. Una vez que el rey Fernando. Once King Ferdinand III takes the town he decides to commend the church, the old mosque, to the Virgin Our Lady. He transforms it and makes it into a church. Here we have the image of Saint Mary of the Eagle. This image is considered a Fernandine image because he was the king who brought the devotion to the Virgin in the town of Alcala. It's believed that this virgin is related to the name of King St. Ferdinand's second wife, Joan of Pontier. Since the eagle is the symbol of the evangelist John, the image takes the title St. Mary of the Eagle. We know that he pursued and professed a great love for the Virgin Mary. His son specifically says this in the poems of St. Mary. He placed each of his campaigns under the Virgin's protection, including the cities that he won, such as Úbeda, Jaén, Córdoba, and Seville itself. That's why Andalusia is still known today as the land of Blessed Virgin Mary. Certainly, King Ferdinand III commended it to her. The conquest is filled with miracles, which the promoters of St. Ferdinand's sanctification will use in their arguments in the 17th century. Of course, St. Ferdinand's devotion to St. Mary is mentioned in the chronicles of his time, the Chronicle of Twenty Kings, the Chronicon Tudensi, and the First General Chronicle, which was written on the initiative of Alfonso X, and they abound in the same sentence, Saint Mary, whose servant we are. Still awake, Your Highness? You rest little. I know that you sleep more, but if I, the King, am not awake, tell me how you can sleep peacefully. He was considered a soldier of Christ. His main concern was the defense of the kingdom and Christianity, which were bound together as Hispanic Christianity. His religious faith was unshakable. It's this faith that led him, primarily, to spread Christianity and, above all, the teachings of the Church throughout his realm. The Christian faith turns Ferdinand III into a great leader who doesn't dodge hardships to help his people, 
and who always accomplishes the goals he sets for himself. He was respectful and treated all the defeated people in the conquered cities very well. Ibn Havari, an Arab chronicler, says that he was a sweet man with political sense. That says a lot about his character, especially coming from an enemy. A remarkable development in Saint Ferdinand's life is his close friendship with an al mohad governor, the Emir of Baeza, al Bayasi. Al Bayasi not only promoted the fact that his territories had assimilated to Castilian rule and submitted to the king of Castile, but also negotiated for the Moorish king of Valencia to go to Cuenca to make himself available to King Saint Ferdinand. Saint Ferdinand formed a close friendship with him. Following al Bayasi's death, his son chose to be baptized, and Saint Ferdinand became his godfather. Lord, knower of hearts and the most secret thoughts men ever had, know that I seek not my glory but yours, and that I do not wish to win back the old kingdoms for the land, but for the growth of the Catholic faith and the Christian religion. They say that he had all the virtues of a good leader. He was an honest, pure, faithful, loyal, prudent and courageous man of integrity. He was virtuous in every way. His son, Alfonso X the Wise, said that he knew neither vice nor idleness. The main devotion, above all else, is to God. St. Ferdinand's faith can be summed up in one word. God, God, God. And all his actions and deeds can be summed up in this word. God, God, God. He who comes from God acts for God. St. Ferdinand is defined by all contemporary sources as a deeply religious man. He stands out for two virtues which all the chronicles and contemporary sources emphasize and which are perhaps difficult to reconcile with the political power that he had. One is the virtue of humility. He always credits all his successes to God, not to his personal merit. He shies away as much as possible from the luxury of court and the influence of political power. The other virtue is chastity. He's one of the few medieval kings without any reported extramarital relationships or illegitimate children. In other words, he sets an example by fulfilling the duties of a Christian marriage. He was a just man with a high regard for justice and the idea of achieving peace among Christians. The virtues of St. Ferdinand are human virtues, but all those virtues had the same goal, which was to build the kingdom of God on earth. How is it that your highness is so successful on the battlefield? It might be that my predecessors were more concerned with extending their greatness than spreading faith, or accumulating vassals instead of building altars. Perhaps that's why their plans failed. I greatly admire the king's Christian virtue of perseverance, 
his capacity for sacrifice, and his determination to accomplish the goals that he set, despite the enormous hardships this entailed. He was a deeply pious man. This religious piety was evident in his construction of some of the great Spanish cathedrals. His wife, Beatrice of Swabia, also sponsored or promoted some construction and improvements in the Cistercian Abbey of Las Huelgas in Burgos. Another interesting thing which appears in many documents is Ferdinand III's concern with honoring the Sunday obligations. He, along with his courts and his vassals, attended Sunday masses and honored their obligations. It's well known and much discussed that Ferdinand III was devoted to the Virgin Mary. He lives during an era of impressive growth, of Marian piety and devotion to the Virgin. Ferdinand was not only a conqueror, a pious man and a man of government, he was also a highly educated man and his court was full of highly educated people. So we can say that he reflects the piety of his time, and the Virgin plays a very important role. Devotion to the Virgin is closely linked to the chivalrous ideal, since it's the paragon of love of the Lady, of the Lady of Ladies. That's what the King represents. Everyone knows that he didn't just dedicate churches in the conquered lands to the Virgin, like the cathedral here in Seville. The definitive fact is that he was a man who spent half his life on horseback, and he always wanted to bring the famous Virgin of the Battles on all his journeys and campaigns. He was constantly accompanied by the image of Our Lady. The life of a saint is based on prayer. He did penance, and he loved the cross. We're not just talking about Christ. He loved the cross. Clearly, kings couldn't live as warrior monks because they had to get married, often for political reasons. They also had to dedicate themselves to making political, judicial and military decisions. But it's true that some exceptionally pious kings, like King Ferdinand III, tried to live according to this ideal of the warrior monk or the Christian knight as much as they could. From his Cistercian and Franciscan spirituality, Ferdinand certainly did. His austerity, sobriety, dedication to prayer and penance have often been emphasized. He felt very connected to the spirit of military orders. Throughout his life, there's an orientation towards and preparation for future life. He was only 50 years old, but he was already exhausted. He devoted his life to God and Spain. He had nothing left to do except prepare for the moment of his passing and to be held accountable before the eternal judge.
Look at me here, my Lord Jesus Christ, in your presence as a wicked criminal. I know the many sins with which I have offended you. No matter how great they may be, I trust your mercy, and that on the merits of your passion and most precious death, you will forgive me. Remember, Lord, the many insults and torments you suffered for me. For them, you have the name of Saviour, Deliver this, your servant, of his sins that were the cause of your sorrows. The truth is that St. Ferdinand's death came, we might say in modern terms, in middle age, but not in old age, since he died at 53. He really wasn't that old. But it's true that after so many years of struggle, conquests and suffering, the life of a warrior has never been easy, his strong body was worn down. He became ill a year before. We know from the chronicles that his disease was the famous dropsy, but in current medical terminology, dropsy is just a set of symptoms. It's fluid retention in simple terms. What did this mean? The king probably had some kind of heart problem. Based on the chronicles, a previous heart issue seems to be the most feasible explanation due to some earlier incidents. Or perhaps he had a kidney problem, which used to be common among noblemen, because the kidney area would get injured from all the days spent on horseback, especially because diets weren't as balanced as today, and obviously because medicine wasn't the same 800 years ago as it is now. So for a year, that extraordinarily strong body became increasingly weak, until a moment came on the 30th of May, 1252, when the king could take no more, and he knew his death was very close. He clings to the cross, kissing it several times, and he ties a rope to himself, possibly symbolizing his nakedness and his return to the other life. We know almost nothing of his birth, but we know a lot about his death. As we know, in the life of a Christian, death is much more important than birth. How you die is what determines everything that comes next, isn't it? There's a striking fact about St. Ferdinand's death that I've been fond of since I was a child. Sick and bedridden when they brought communion, he got out of bed and went down on his knees to receive the blessed sacrament of the Eucharist. He understood that before the King of Kings, before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, he must get out of bed and kneel. For me, it's the fact of his death which stands out the most, this deep devotion to the Blessed Sacrament and this profound humility of a powerful king who kneels before Christ in the Eucharist. That moment of his death was greatly admired at the time and is portrayed in a Virgilio Mattoni painting. It truly shows us who the king was, as well as that humility which we know he had, that humility before God. At the moment when the king feels that he's going to die, he states that he is a soul that has arrived. It's said, we arrive into this world alone and we must leave it alone. 
He reminds God that he has received power from him. He's received lordships, kingdoms, all that he has until he's become the Iberian Peninsula's most powerful man at the time. But at the moment of death, all of this returns to God who has given it to him. From then on, already at peace with God, he says goodbye to his children. He reminds the eldest that he must follow his government's guidelines. Saint Ferdinand's life set the best example for Alfonso. When the king dies, he is mourned deeply by the people around him, his sons, his widow, his knights. It's a great loss at a human level, which is perhaps the most important, and of course at spiritual and earthly levels. The great king dies. I believe that on May 30th, there wasn't a single bell in the kingdom that didn't toll in memory of this great man. In Seville, Saint Ferdinand is buried at the Virgin's feet where he wanted to stay forever. After his death, his son Alfonso X the Wise wanted these words to be engraved on his father's tomb. Here lies the very honorable King Ferdinand, Lord of Castile and Toledo, Leon, Galicia, Seville, Cordoba, Murcia, and Jaén, the one who conquered all Spain, the most loyal, the truest, the frankest, and the most earnest. And it goes on. As soon as he dies, people begin to say that he's holy. Focusing on the century in question, he sets an example as a Christian, as a gentleman, and a family man. To put it simply, he sets an example as a man. Was it saintliness? After a very short time, it's true that local people at his burial site in the Seville Cathedral began to comment that there seemed to be a halo around him. It looked like it was shimmering. St. Ferdinand was considered holy practically from the moment he died. Medieval tales describe how people who were sick would kiss St. Ferdinand's sword, and after that, they were cured. He starts to acquire a reputation for holiness and virtue. Word reaches the rulers of Seville and the Council of the Seville Cathedral. They promote the possibility of King Ferdinand's beatification. Following his death, he was hailed as a saint locally in Seville. Pope Clement X only certified what the entire Hispanic and European political community was continually proclaiming. Therefore, the decree that was signed on the 4th of February 1671 did nothing but confirm King Ferdinand III's rise to the altars. His beatification will take about 27 years. For 27 years he's named the Blessed, but the beatification is limited to Seville, its cathedral and the royal chapel. This is not enough. His initial canonization takes place before the Pope in 1671, then extends to Spanish territories in the Americas. In the year 1672, Clement X, the same Pope, extends the sainthood to the entire Roman Catholic Church. His reign is a milestone in the history of Castile, Leon, and especially Spain. He's a saint who's ahead of his time because he's a lay saint. So what does he propose? What does Saint Ferdinand propose to us all? He proposes that everything we do in life should have a purpose, 
and that that purpose should be to find the good in life. And the greatest good is God. So, whatever we do, wherever we are, we should always look for God in everything. I believe that Saint Ferdinand, all in all, wasn't meant to be the king that he finally turned out to be. In any case, he would have been a good king of Leon. But he was called by providence. As Christians, we obviously believe in providence. So, he was destined to carry out a great mission, and that's what he did. St. Ferdinand's justice and mercy were not human virtues or qualities. Those were virtues learned from Jesus Christ. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been what he was. The life of St. Ferdinand teaches us, first and foremost, constant and total dedication to a mission. From the beginning of his reign, he takes on the mission in the wake of previous kings, to recover Spain, to restore faith and to defend the Church. To my understanding, his life teaches us that anyone, regardless of one's situation in life, can do great deeds in a Christian way, even to the extent of becoming a saint. For each of us, isn't it our mission to do what's within our means? What example does he set for us? He teaches us not to compartmentalize our lives. I do one thing, and so I'm a Christian, but I live my life in my own way. No, you have to live your life as God wills it. That's what we're going to have left. Over time, as you get older, what remains at the end of your life are those actions that you do because God asks you. Our actions, when they have a Christian value, have a different dimension. That different dimension is what God wants for us, and it's what St. Ferdinand had when he said, No, I don't want more land. I don't conquer to expand the land. I conquer to expand the kingdom. The examples that St. Ferdinand can set for Christians in today's world are, on the one hand, the steadfastness and defense of the faith. He ruled for the common good of society. On top of this, he guided his subjects toward the eternal goal, the power to bring them the greatest possible good on earth, but also to lead them to the highest goal of heaven and eternal life. Once Gregory IX, talking about St. Ferdinand's zeal and fervor, declared him an athlete of Christ. He was a true athlete. You've seen it for yourselves here. A man given completely to God, a man who loves his people, whom he wants to govern not only so that they may live well in this world, but above all so that they may earn a place in heaven, just as he did by fulfilling the mission that God had entrusted to him, for his glory and for Spain. I want to make your whole life a wonderful representation and parable, so that the coming centuries contemplate the war that I, the eternal King and the universal Lord, wage against the power of darkness to conquer the whole world for my Father. <laughs>